Okay, as promised, today's lecture is probably the most boring lecture on the planet. Uh, I apologize, but there is very helpful information um, in these, I'm going to say it, slides of lists. You know, I hate doing slides of lists, but uh, this is the best place to do it, and I thought I'd lump it all into one lecture so then we don't have to do just lists of boring stuff. But there's lots of good information in here. This is the stuff that is hard to <clears throat> teach as a, um, you know, yes, no answer, but uh, it's helpful in making, helping you make decisions. All of these things are not... Um, uh, hard rules, but they're very good generalizations. So we're going to treat them more or less as rules right now, understanding that if there's a rule, there's always an exception. So bear that in mind. There was one thing, there was a question or some people struggling with um, the assignment last week. And because I have this beautiful table here behind me, I wanted to point something out. One of the things was there were beams that didn't have a column at the end that framed into another beam. And people were a little bit confused about what that meant, where the load went. Does it go all back to the other column or where does that go? So the best way to think about that is to ask yourself a thought process. You understand that this table, let's take a look, that this table, if I sit in the middle of this table, Half of my load is going to go to this end, and half of my load is going to go to this end. So I'm sitting right in the middle. And you intuitively understand that. And there happens to be two columns at each end, so a quarter would go to each end. I'm sitting right in the middle. A quarter, quarter goes to each end. What happens if there weren't columns at the end of this? What if this connected into another table, say? What if this had a ledger where it connected into another table? And I sat in the middle. Where does the load go then? Does it still half go to that end and half go to that end? Yes, you intuitively understand that where the load goes doesn't change in that situation. So if that is framed into something else, the load is going to be transferred to that. So there was an example in the assignment where there was a beam that one end was supported on a column and the other end it connected into a beam and there if we put a load in the middle of the beam we were talking about half of it would go to the column at one end and half of it would be a point load on the other beam and you're going to see when we get further into things that that would be what we would call a girder that's a beam that's still a beam, it's doing the job of a beam, but it's a one that seems like it's doing a little bit more than the rest because it's picking up a load from another beam. And so that's one that we might call a girder. And in a couple weeks, we're going to do sizing guidelines and that's gonna be really helpful to kind of have in our head the hierarchy of what's a purlin, what's a beam, and what's a girder. And we're gonna go through that then. I'll go through that in depth and I'll say it probably 50 times throughout this course. So today's lecture is the beginnings of just understanding building systems. Um, I, the way I was given the outline of this course is that you guys should already know all this, but there's nowhere you guys get taught it in any of the curriculum, and I don't really think that's fair to have you not ha understand these things um, if no one's ever taught them to you or even just talked about it. So what I strive to do in this lecture is talk about all of those things that people assume you know about basic construction and the roles of different things in a building. So we're going to talk about the role of structure. We're going to talk about the advantages and disadvantages of the different materials. We're going to talk about how to pick your material. We're going to talk about the elements of a building. Um, and then this line here, pretty pictures and funny stories of systems and materials, is next week's lecture. So sorry. The only thing that is fun and exciting about this happens in next week's lecture. Um, I might even update this slide. Okay. 
So the role of the structure, it's got to hold up itself. So all of the sticks that hold up the building have to hold up their own self weight. They have to support the applied loads. So somebody walking around on it and they have to support the building envelope. So that is uh, all of the things we wrap our building in. So our cladding and our roofing. So we have to supply something that holds all that up as well. So it's basically the bones. If you want to think of a person, we have to, uh, the, the structure is the bone, so it has to be able to support itself. The applied loads are our clothes, a backpack, food we eat. So we need to be able to hold that up. And we need to support the building envelope. So that would be our skin and our muscles. So obviously we have different types of construction and there are lots of different ones. What I am focusing on in this lecture is the basics. Um, mostly because those are the ones that are the go-to. They're the ones that are common here. I apologize if you are from uh, other parts of the world than in Toronto. This isn't about exclusion of techniques. It is about uh, a global majority. So this isn't just what's common here in Toronto. These are the global majorities. Um, things that might be unique, um, like uh, bamboo construction, still isn't that common, even where it is the most common. So it would be like straw bale, um, you know, in the, the Midwest, for example. Um, can be quite popular in its very specific locale, but it's not the kind of global norm. Um, so we're not going to spend much time talking about it, we'll just identify that it exists um, and then kind of move on. So the main ones, structural steel, reinforced concrete, and wood, and wood is broken up into two categories. Nominal lumber, which is your stick frame construction, like houses where you go to the store at Home Depot and buy the lumber. Um, and then mass timber, which is more along the lines of structural steel or reinforced concrete in its kind of mass. It's the same style of construction or the same kind of um, zone of construction, if you will. Uh, there's also precast concrete. Um, there are certainly parts of the world where it is very, very popular. It is less popular as kind of a global construction, and it's actually not that common here even. It usually has very specific uh, types of construction, so it doesn't have as broad a range. But there are some elements that are quite common. Um, Load-bearing masonry used to be very, very popular um, as a main construction type. Not so much anymore. It tends to now be used with other elements as a supporting element. Um, so localized elements might be uh, load-bearing masonry. So it might be combined with wood, uh, it might be combined with steel, or it might be combined with uh, precast. So I'm just going to add that to slide three, uh, masonry, precast as a combo. So let's start with concrete. And we're going to talk about the uh, advantages and disadvantages. I'm also going to grab my water. So hold on, guys. I'm not going far. I filled it up. Okay. So the advantages are concrete. Sorry, I'm right. I'm back. Um, I might have to film this lecture in two parts as well. Um, I forgot that we go back to three modules of school for the kids today, and I wasn't quite prepared for that, so I have to end a little bit earlier than I need to, simply because I need to be there for the start of the module for my four-year-old. Okay, concrete advantages and disadvantages. This does not mean that um, it's a bad construction type or the right construction type. These are just the things that tend to impact when and where you use them. So the advantages of concrete, um, it's very adaptable, meaning that we can use it in different ways. That is not to be confused with alterations, which is a disadvantage. So adaptable means that we can use it in very unique ways because we can form it however we want to. Concrete was very popular in the 50s and 60s, um, specifically because of that. Um, in the 50s and 60s, uh, labor was very cheap and materials were very, very expensive. 
Um, so anything that you could do to save on material, even if it meant throwing labor hours at it, was seen as an advantage. And remember, what rules all is cost. Cost is, unfortunately, the predominant choice in everything we do. Is that the right thing? Mm, probably not necessarily, but our clients are the ones paying for this. So we have to bear that as a thought in our mind. Um, so in the 50s and 60s, they would do elaborate form work that took a lot of man hours to take away material. In today's market, um, um, material, material is very cheap and labor is very expensive. So it's not that today when we see boxy concrete structures that um, people are lazy um, or not inventive. It's that it's actually the cheaper way to build it. Um, back in the day, it wasn't that they had a better appreciation for the craft. It was because what happened to look so very beautiful also happened to be the cheapest way to build it. Uh, concrete has a very short lead time. Um, if somebody gets awarded the contract, they can start mobilizing probably within a week or two, assuming they're not very busy already, but um, there's not a lot of um, back work that needs to be happening. They can start to get ready on site very, very, very quickly. You will see though uh, that, um, uh, I'm gonna add a line to this. I mean, in disadvantages, in concrete disadvantages, I'm going to add on site long. So concrete, they can mobilize very quickly, but it takes a long time to actually build it. You have to do it. You have to pour a floor, wait for it to cure, form the second floor, pour it, wait for it to cure and do it incrementally. So sometimes that can be very advantageous, especially if, uh, depending on what type of um, uh, mortgage or lending setup they have with the bank, um, banks don't like to give out money until they see things happening on site. Even if there's a lot happening in the background, they tend not to care. Um, so concrete being able to show up on site very early can sometimes make a big difference in how the client is managing their money for the project. Uh, concrete has a shallow depth of structure. Um, so I'm going to draw probably a lot of little pictures um, with this one. Um, we're going to do more on this later, so don't worry about it too much. But concrete has a nice shallow depth of structure. Um, and I'll compare it with steel as we go. Um, so concrete, my lines are not going to be very flat here. So concrete might have, you know, this depth over here and this depth right here is our slab. So a beam and a slab here. Steel, on the other hand, I'm drawing the deck is a very thin thing. Um, I am drawing something, don't, don't worry. So steel, if we have our deck spanning from joist to joist to joist, it's actually shallower right where the deck is, but we have our joists here that make a deeper structure. So locally, it's shallower, uh, and locally it's deeper than the concrete structure. So the concrete one overall tends to have a shallower depth of structure. By how much, it really depends on the spans and what's happening. Concrete finishes makes a very good finish. Concrete can be the finish. If it's done right, um, if the contract say it says that it's the finished surface, it does not take a huge premium to make it um, a, very nice, uh, a very nice finish, but they do have to know. It's non-combustible. Now this is very important. Fire rating and combustible are not the same thing. Concrete is non-combustible. It will not burn. It also has a good fire rating, which means it does not lose strength if the things around it burn. 
So those are two different things. One is, does it burn? And the second one is, how does it behave when things around it burn? So concrete is non-combustible, it will not burn, and it has a good fire rating, meaning if the things around it burn, it will still perform very well structurally. Concrete can be used for acoustics. It can be ductile. And we're going to talk a lot in structures too about what ductility means. But essentially, we like ductile construction. We need it for seismic or earthquake construction. So it is very, very, very important to have ductility in your structure or a thing that absorbs energy in our structures that are in high seismic zones. So in Canada, that would be, you know, Ottawa, Montreal, Vancouver. Uh, in the States, definitely uh, California. There are some other zones that have it. Um, you know, Japan, um, parts of China, Alaska, um, parts with high seismic zones, um, New Zealand. Um, we need to make sure we have ductility. Concrete, ha if you design it right with steel reinforcing in it, can be performed very well for ductility. But it takes a lot of engineering to make it work. It has good corrosion resistance. So corrosion resistance means if chemicals are put on it, and that includes salt, um, that it doesn't degrade easily. Um, anyone who is actually living in Toronto and has driven under the gardener and looked up and has seen concrete spalling off, you will think concrete does not do well in a corrosive environment. That's actually because the steel in it doesn't do very well. Um, and so we do things to the concrete to help protect it or to protect the steel from the, for example, the salt corrosion. Um, uh, but the gardener also was only meant to have a 30 year lifespan and I think it's in its 70th year now. So uh, some small spalling um, and uh, imperfections due to corrosion have well surpassed its life expectancy. Now, I personally think we should be designing things for 100 years, um, but uh, and not be surprised if they make it to 70 years. Concrete disadvantages. Spans. It cannot span very far, specifically because it weighs so much. So as we try to span further, we need to make things deeper and concrete so heavy that it contributes to the weight problem, which makes it this vicious cycle where you simply cannot get it big enough to work for the span. So concrete can limit out on span length. Concrete isn't good for alterations. Now, here is why. If we looked at the wall of a concrete building and the same wall for steel and we're going to say that this is part of our lateral load resisting system. So our concrete one over here we want to put this door in and the steel one we want to put this door in. Well if this is a solid wall we don't know how hard every bit of this is working. We have to cut through the actual structural elements. So we have to do calculations. We have to know how much reinforcing is that in there. The steel one, if we just know that that's where the brace is, well then it's no problem. We just put the door where there's no brace. And it's very easy to make an alteration then. Um, I did a project that was a renovation in High Park uh, in like 2015 um, and they wanted to on a massive building put one small door opening on one small floor by inspection and yes an engineer can say by inspection it works because it was such a small door and there was so much lateral load resisting system that I knew that any calculation would say it was reduced by less than one percent so not a problem go for it uh, the, whoever was managing that project at the building department um, was very upset by that and they wanted a full 3D analysis of the structure to prove that they could do that door opening. Um, of course, I mean, I could do that, there's no problem for it, but the owner 
simply wanted to put a small door in. And instead, they were being told they had to hire an engineer to re-engineer the entire 11-story concrete building. It doesn't seem like a fair cost because the drawings weren't complete and we needed to look at the analysis of taking the door out. Um, I felt really bad for the owner, um, but I shouldn't have to pay for that cost myself either. So the owner and I worked something out, um, but I also wrote a letter um, kind of stating that in, in concrete, it's really interesting that sometimes it's a, sometimes we might call a wall 200, even though it's 203 because it was actually built metric. It's very common to interchange those two, um, almost without thought, and no one would ever question it in the analysis, that whether we were talking about a wall that was 200 millimeters or 203 millimeters, which is eight inches times 25.4 millimeters. Um, uh, the difference of that three millimeters in the calculation had a bigger impact than that door opening. Um, so I, uh, I don't often take a stand on things, but I, I took a stand on that and had to point that out to the building department. But they don't get to just be unreasonable. Um, there has to be a logic and a reason behind the questions they're asking. We have to do things that are responsible and reasonable, so they have to ask questions that are responsible and reasonable as well. Um, concrete is highly susceptible to weather. Um, extremely hot and extremely cold, we can't cast concrete. Or if we want to, we have to take measures to be able to do it, and those can be very expensive. In the cold, you can't really pour concrete below minus five. Um, even at five degrees, you have to take means to keep it somewhat warm, but they're not that invasive. Um, lower than that, um, most concrete construction just stops. Um, unless you can encase it and heat the zone, which means you have to build basically a fake tarped building to be able to cast your concrete. And so for a, you know, a 12 story concrete condo, you can't tarp in that whole zone um, to try to pour the concrete. There was a, a, a project beside the office I was working in in 2014 and for those who live in Toronto, that was one of the coldest winters on record uh, here. And we, the construction just stopped. Contractors lost a fortune because they build in some buffer for delays due to cold weather, um, but it was just beyond what anyone expected. So they had almost no days they could work throughout the winter, so they took a huge hit. It's not fair for them to bear that cost alone. The owner has to bear some of that cost, too. Is it fair? It's weather. We can't control it. Um, but then the next year was the warmest on record, uh, and they basically lost zero days all winter to construction. So, you know, we really can't predict what's going to happen. They were calling for a cold winter this year, and here where I am, you know, we've really just only had the first couple days that are below minus five. Um, and we here, right here in Port Hope, have had zero snow. We had one day with like five centimeters and that's it. Uh, quality control is a disadvantage with concrete. Um, we have to go look at the working bit. So an engineer is responsible to go and take a look at the structure on the owner's behalf. Um, the contractor is required to have somebody to come in and inspect the structure on both their and the owner's behalf. Um, with concrete, you have um, a rebar in it, and there is a lot of small pieces of rebar throughout the whole project. And I'll show you pictures next week that show what a mesh of rebar looks like. And it can be a little bit overwhelming and a small dimensional mistake can result in, <coughs> sorry, um, could result in a very big mix up. So if we need our steel to be 300 millimeters apart and somebody didn't read the drawings correctly and they placed them 400 millimeters apart over the span of a big massive building, that could result in a lot of missing steel. And it's not obvious just to look at it that it's missing because it still looks like a lot of steel. It's not easy to just pick up at a glance. Steel, on the other hand, 
Um, you can see very quickly if a member is missing or things aren't put together the way they should be. So quality control is pretty difficult in concrete. I pointed out weight. Um, in, uh, in concrete, we uh, have to build a building twice. So concrete is a liquid until it cures. Don't ever say dry in front of an engineer. They will lose their mind. It cures. Um, so while it's liquid, we need something to hold it up. So we have to use formwork. So we build basically a crappy wood building, pour the liquid concrete in it, let it cure, and then take the crappy wood building away. And when I say crappy, I mean just because there's lots of columns everywhere, it's not the prettiest wood, it's not something you could live in, but we have to build it to support the liquid concrete. Now then we can move it up a floor and we can reuse it. So the way that you can make concrete cost effective is by reusing the part you have to build twice as much as possible. If, you have, if you're building a one-story concrete building, you're building it twice and you're paying for all the wood once and you're paying for all the concrete once. If you're building a five-story concrete building with the same floor plan, that wood component, instead of being half of the cost, is only going to be one-sixth of the cost. Because each concrete floor is the cost of its floor, but you get to reuse that wood bit five times. So it's basically like six structures instead. Um, so amortizing the cost of the wood can be very important in concrete construction. Concrete applications. We like to use it a lot. Oh, sorry, there was one last one. The environmental cost. And this one is huge. Um, concrete is bad for the environment. Any construction is bad for the environment, honestly. Um, but concrete is probably one of the worst. Um, I am sure there are people that would argue that, uh, but I don't think, I don't think they're right. Um, and I think those people would be in the minority, and those would be people who have a stake in the game. But concrete is bad for the environment. So we should be starting to think, as much as it is probably one of the main means of construction in the world today, we need to start thinking about changing that. I said in the 50s and 60s, um, material cost ruled the market. It was expensive. Um, today's market... Um, labor costs rule the market. They're expensive. We are at a precipice where we are changing what rules the market. And we are a huge part of this as the designers. We need to make the environmental cost rule the market. We, we should make it as affordable as possible still, but we cannot neglect the environmental cost within that. Um, uh, concrete applications, mid-rise apartment buildings and mid-rise office buildings. Those ones are great because the spans aren't long, so usually six to nine meters, closer to six meters, tends to be kind of the, the primary grid. Um, and they're the same, usually the same layout, floor after floor after floor, so you get to reuse that formwork again and again and again, which makes the cost kind of amortize out. Parking garages? Same thing, but now you've added in the fact that they're good for corrosion resistance. Um, uh, they are the finished surface very often. Um, and they're really good for unique structures. So this is where maybe cost is less of a, a governing factor. And this is where we might go back to looking at the techniques of the 50s and 60s. Acknowledging that what makes it cost affordable is not the same, um, that that is a more expensive way to build in today's market, but we can do unique things, beautiful shells, for example, um, where you're willing to spend the money to get a beautiful, unique form. And do not get me wrong, I do not think that beauty should come at the expense of the market. I think beautiful buildings have a very important place in our world, and sometimes you have to pay a premium for those. What impacts the cost of concrete? Well, I talked about the formwork. The formwork um, can be very, uh, well, it is probably one of the biggest costs. The strength of the, co the concrete can have an impact on the cost. And I'm going gonna, gonna to change the order on some of the ones on this slide. I already had a um, 
So this is slide five, order of cost. The strength is an impact on the cost, but it's not a huge one. Um, additives can be very expensive. So we might add concrete additives. Now this wouldn't be the engineer that decides that. This would be the concrete mix people. So there are people, we put a general guideline on what the mix needs to be, but then the, um, there's almost another engineer that, that specifies the exact mix because that is their expertise. Um, uh, like the same way you'd have a contractor, but you might not have them do your terrazzo floor. It's kind of the same idea. Um, but the concrete additives might be things that make it flow easier or the things that let you work with it on a hotter day or a colder day or things that you might add that help it cure faster because you're on a tight timeline. Um, things that might make it cure with a better finish because it is going to be the final finish. So these are, where the, these are all the things where communication with the design team and what you put as its final purpose in the contract documents is very important. Spans. Concrete does not like to span very far, so if you're trying to make it span far, there is a cost premium. Loading can impact the cost of uh, a concrete building, but the big one is really uh, the formwork and time of year. Um, the time of year, because in the winter, it starts to be very cost prohibitive to build with concrete. Steel. Steel is very strong and it's very stiff. And this says light, but concrete weighs three times, or steel weighs three times as much as concrete. So how does that make sense? Why would we say a steel structure is light when steel weighs three times the amount of concrete? Well, here's why. It is so strong and it is so stiff that we need a fraction of the material, a lot less than a third of the material. So it ends up being lighter than our concrete structures because we need so much less material because it is strong and stiff. Therefore, the amount of steel in the entire building is going to weigh less than the amount of concrete in the equivalent building. It can do very long spans. You might have to be smart about the engineering, but you can make steel span very far distances. The size of the columns can be quite small. Um, uh, that can be advantageous if your client is, maybe it's a retail space or an office space that they're renting out. Um, if you have big columns in, in, at a scattered grid throughout the floor, that's taking up valuable retail space. So uh, having small columns can be very important. Quality control is very easy in steel. We have kind of a two-stage process where we quality control. Um, I send out drawings. A steel fabricator then produces their own drawings, or something we call shop drawings. So we'll have architectural drawings and structural drawings that we as the design team make. And then on the contractor side, they're going to produce shop drawings of the steel. And they send those to me to review. I say this looks like it matches what I've got on my structural drawings. I send it back to them with any markups. And then they go to site and build it. And on site, it's very easy to see problems with steel. I mean, maybe the depth is wrong or the width is wrong and we need to uh, make a quick measurement, but the odds of a steel contractor putting the wrong beam in place is very, very rare. The things that they might miss are they didn't put in all of their anchor bolts uh, or all of their bolts for shear. So it tends to be smaller things that are an issue when we do quality control on steel. Still very important. Um, welding, for example, where they actually have a third person come in and actually look at the quality of the weld. Um, it can be installed fast. So uh, as much as concrete uh, can get on site fast, it takes a long time to erect. Steel has a long lead time that whole shop drawing process I talked about, they make the steel in a shop, so it's almost all made, so it takes a long time for them to get to site, but once they're there, it goes up quick. Probably in a normal building, they can do a story a day, whereas, as in concrete, they can do a story at most once a week because they need to let the concrete cure. So it, it can be a fraction of the time to install it, but it takes a long time behind the scenes. So in the end, 
the we're hiring you to build this and the day it's done are probably very, very, very similar, but how much they're on site can be a big difference. Now that can be a real advantage with steel if you have other trades working on the site, and then the steel just comes in and uses a crane quickly to install it. So it really has a varied, um, you have to know what your criteria are to make the choice sometimes. Um, like I said, steel is great for future alterations. You know, we know exactly where the structure is, so popping a door, making a change can be quite easy. Um, there's a fabrication benefit. So we, those long spans we want to do, we can build something in the shop that isn't a normal steel member that meets what we need it to do. If we can figure out the problem, we can usually figure out a steel solution to it. Um, whereas concrete, we can sometimes be just up against a wall where we have to say, no, we cannot do that. Um, steel is non-combustible, meaning just like concrete, it will not burn. It is not the thing that is going to burn. But look over here, it has a poor fire rating. So concrete doesn't burn, behaves well when other things burn. Steel doesn't burn, but it does not behave well when other things around it burn. Steel is very susceptible to heat from the elements around it. So we're not talking on a hot day, turn the thermostat up. We're talking in a fire. When we have high, high heats, um, that we can actually uh, make steel, it actually can make steel lose capacity. Um, so we rate the amount of time that we have that the material works to hold the load. And that's why we say fire rating. And we'll have a one hour, two hour, three hour, 45 minute fire rating. And that comes out of the building code, and so we have to satisfy the building code. Steel can perform poorly in vibration, simply because it is strong and stiff and we don't need much material. It has this perception that it is bad in vibration. Um, so often what we'll do is we'll put a little bit of concrete back in to help deal with vibration. Remember I was talking about concrete on metal deck last week? Well, that concrete can be very good because it gives us a wearable surface um, and it can help us with vibration as well. Remember that heel drop we did? That concrete can be very good for damping our vibration. Um, and like I showed you in this drawing, steel can be very deep. Now, it's going to be very localized where it's deep um, and very shallow in other spots. But if you are trying to run ducts under here, that can be a real problem. Now maybe you can run ducts through it or through it, but that really depends on the design. So steel applications, very low and very high buildings. That's not to say you can't do mid-rise buildings in steel. It's just that those are so very often condos and offices, and we've seen that concrete is very, very good at those. So good, in fact, that we just often don't bother with steel at that range. Um, shopping centers can be very good for steel. They can be very good for concrete, too. Hospitals, same thing. Concrete and steel could be very good. Uh, schools, warehouses and industrial buildings are very good steel buildings. Um, we have large spans, so you can move um, trucks around inside the building. Um, warehouses and industrial buildings are rarely going to be built out of any of the other materials. It's usually going to be a steel building. And then systems buildings. Now system buildings are um, a style of construction that are designed by the fabricator. So uh, anyone who plays hockey has probably been in the style of building where every few meters, like four or five meters, there is a steel frame that goes up and over the, the, the rink pad or it, a big arch. They usually taper and taper. Here, why don't I, why don't I draw you a picture of what I'm talking about? A lot of you have probably seen this style of construction where there's a series of arches that look like this. 
We call this a three-pinned arch because there's a pin at the floor and a pin right there. And basically, these two things are propped against each other. And they can't tip over because they're rigid at this point right here. Um, these are very efficiently designed. They are not the prettiest in the world, um, but they are very, very efficient. The main problem is that um, the design team loses some control. Uh, the way the contract works is that you sign over uh, a lot of your control about um, kind of some of the finishing elements. There's usually lots of um, funny little brackets and things that stick off of this. Um, so in its place, it is fantastic. And so systems buildings, always out of steel. They're wonderful for their style of application. Okay, wood, I used to have one slide for wood. Um, and then in recent years, um, as, ma as mass timber has become more and more popular, uh, it was tending to confuse people that I had some notes on the same page that were some applicable to mass timber, some applicable to residential. So this is the first year where I've broken out this slide into two things. Residential construction, we're talking about, yes, single story homes, but we're also talking about, you know, four to six story uh, kind of condos or apartment buildings, you know, those long ones that kind of spread out a little bit. Um, those are often done uh, in a nominal number. So these are the types of buildings that you would build out of, you know, two by sixes, two by eights, two by twelves, or nominal lumber. Um, they're cheap, uh, lead time, you can, you know, if we pull the trigger, even if you can't get your big order, you can go to Home Depot and start buying the material, to, well, we're in lockdown, so not tomorrow, but pretty darn quick, you can walk, you can go in and pick up the material you need. Um, you don't have to do a big order, but, uh, you know, you can go start to do those things pretty quickly. Um, it gets installed very fast, similar to wood, or similar to steel. Once you start, it goes very quickly. Um, available workforce. It does not, you do not need to be certified in almost anything to build with wood. If I want to build a wood deck, I call up all my girlfriends and say, I'll provide the pizza and beer, come over here and help me build the deck. Um, they do not need to be skilled laborers to do it. Um, you should have somebody on site that knows what they're doing so you don't end up with wonky uh, construction. But uh, you have a widely available workforce to build these things. Thermal properties. Um, wood is surprisingly good with thermal properties. So this is a big thing um, kind of in the environmental side of our buildings. You know, um, it costs a lot to heat a building, so we worry about being able to contain that heat. And when we have things um, punch through buildings, uh, it can bring cold in. Um, you're going to talk a lot about those things in kind of your building science classes. Um, but wood, as a finish, can perform very well thermally. It's not as good as insulation by any means, but it is a hell of a lot better than concrete and steel. My, uh, me and my husband collect cheap, crappy properties. Um, uh, so I have uh, an island on Lake Nipissing that came with a cottage. So it's a, it's a five hour drive to get there. There's, There's no, no power. Um, you have to take a boat to get to it. Um, but once you're there, it's absolutely divine. But the building is unlike any construction I have ever seen before. It is two by eight planks standing up like this, connected together. It's tongue and groove and nothing else. There's no studs, there's no plywood. It is just a series of two by material all the way around. And this is full size. It was built in the 50s and they had a local mill that they had to make it. And it is actually two inches thick because lumber, when we say a two by material, actually isn't two inches thick. It's actually an inch and a half. So this is actually two inches thick. I have gone up to that cottage in the winter where I've walked across the lake, it's a seven kilometer hike to get to the cottage, and there's no power, so there's no uh, kind of electric heat, um, where all we've had is a wood stove. 
And if you get that wood stove going and it is not windy, you can, on a minus 10 day, get it up to 15 to 20 degrees inside the cottage. <clears throat> Here's the problem with that particular building. <clears throat> because the joints aren't caulked or anything, um, the wood has knots in it, on a windy day, oh my goodness, is it ever cold in there. Because the wind just comes right through and blows the heat out, it is impossible to get it up. Even at the same temperature, you, you probably have a hard time getting up above five degrees on a, a windy day up there. We haven't done that since we've had the kids. Uh, treatment options. You can apply things to wood very easily. You can paint it, you can seal it, you can do pressure treating on it. It's corrosion resistant. Um, surprisingly, it is pretty good for corrosion, depending on what material you're talking about. It does, if you come over to disadvantages, it is prone to decay. So that is water um, as a problem. It's environmentally neutral in properly managed forests. Um, if, if you, you just, just go and clear cut forest, forest obviously, obviously that is absolutely, absolutely horrible. horrible. But in a properly managed forest, uh, wood can be environmentally neutral. So some disadvantages. It is combustible. Um, so wood burns. Our seal and our concrete do not burn, but our wood, it very much will burn. Uh, it's not great for vibration. Designing connections is really hard. Um, you still have to connect these things with steel, uh, and um, it can end up governing the look of your building. The connections can end up being the governing factor of everything you're doing in wood. Member sizes, um, they can be quite large. Uh, it can be prone to decay uh, if it is in the right sort of environment. Um, so if it gets wet and dries and wet and dries and wet and dries, so wood against soil, for example, where it's kept moist, um, oh, I said that word, sorry everyone, um, if it's kept near soil where it gets wet and then doesn't fully dry, but kind of sort of does, wood does very bad. Wood underwater? Wood underwater is fantastic. It's the spot where it uh, dries. It, it gets wet and dries. I said my husband and I connect collect crappy properties. In 2013, we bought, sight unseen, a fish shack in Nova Scotia. We've since sold it. But this actually went out, we did not make any money on it, <laughs> um, went built out over the water. So this is, this is the ground. These are posts, this is the building, and this is the wharf. It was a wharf, it was a series of fish shacks that all shared a long wharf. So there was like, um, 20 huts that shared a wharf and you were responsible for your particular portion of wharf and there was actually working um, fishing trawlers at that wharf. Um, now, I don't know if you know anything about Nova Scotia, but they are known for having the highest tides in the world. So low tide, water can be down here. High tide, water can be up here. So we go up to high tide and down to low tide. This part of the post goes in and out of the water uh, um, several times a day. So, you know, we have high tide twice a day. So every 12 hours we were getting a high tide, low tide. Um, so uh, the wood, when we bought this, the pictures showed everything fine. The first time we showed up, the wharf at one corner was collapsed into the ocean. This right here had rotted right there at that point. And it literally rotted away like that. So it was where it got wet and dried again and again and again. Now, because that actually looks like a very sharp stake, when the bottom part gave out and it fell down into the water, it became stable again because that drove into the ocean floor. It was just a very sloped surface, nothing that you were comfortable walking on. We did repair it. We uh, jacked it up. Um, maybe I'll find that video and share it if I can, if I can find it easily. Um, 
So that's where it can be prone to decay. Uh, the last one is that it's not great for fire resistance. So this is our residential construction category. Um, wood or elements burn, um, elements that can burn perform very badly with re-radiating surfaces. If you know anything about wood construction, this is a plan detail, or I guess it could be a floor detail as well. We have plywood with, with joists, joists or studs. So whether that's a stud or a joist, it's, it's, it's the same idea. And then that is our plywood here. If we have flame in there, it the heat bounces off of here and can burn that, and it bounces back. And so the heat re-radiates off of each other. If you've ever tried to light a fire, um, if you've gone camping, for example, you don't um, take a log, set it on the fire, and put a match or a lighter to it. It won't light. What you want is a series of small elements that the heat can bounce off of each other um, to basically build that fire up. Um, and we're going to see how that is different for mass timber. So let's look at wood mass timber. So this is the large scale construction. Um, we're going to talk about what all of these different things are uh, in next week's lecture and again later in the term. But mass timber um, is more on the scale of uh, steel construction. So think of it as um, uh, kind of a comparable or replacement to steel and concrete construction. So it's the, it's the new kid on the market that kind of gives steel and concrete a run for its money. Residential construction, small scale residential construction, nominal lumber is ubiquitous. So like our steel, um, it gets installed fast. It has a long lead time because it gets prepared in a shop somewhere else, same way as our steel. But then once they show up on site, it gets assembled very quickly. It has great thermal properties. So similar to our uh, nominal lumber, it has great thermal properties, but we have more of it. It's usually very thick, so we can get pretty good thermal properties out of it. Um, treatment options, corrosion resistant, same thing. He and environmentally neutral and properly managed forests. Here's the big difference. It's fire resistant or it's fire rating is really good because of its large dimensions. There's two things. We talked about the re-radiating surface. If we've got, instead of a series of um, small objects like that, we've got a big flat floor plate with beams far apart, that re-radiating surface doesn't exist the same way. So one, we've taken away a lot of the re-radiating surfaces, the little cubbies and holes as things burn. The second is um, rate of burn. So wood, it burns at, I think it's an inch and a half an hour, an inch an hour. There's a, a published rate on how much it burns and it's somewhere in that zone. So our two by six here, if it burns an inch and a half, in an hour, we'd have nothing left of this material. Our big elements, after an hour, we'd still have some structural component left. Um, so if somebody was still trapped in the building, there is still a structure that they can get out on. Here's a third thing about mass timber, is that as it burns, it builds up a char um, that has no burnable material left. So as it kind of creates a char on the outside, we stop having access to the easily burnable material that's inside it. Disadvantage, it is combustible though. And sometimes there are mandates in the code that are just, you are not allowed to have a combustible building. Um, you can have a combustible building if you protect it. So you maybe need to do drywall. Now, one of the big things about mass timber is you want it exposed. So why would we do the mass timber and then encapsulate it in drywall? There might still, those environmental reasons still might be a good reason though. 
Uh, same thing, vibration, vibration, connections, member sizes, possible decay are all going to be disadvantages. Um, but lead time now as well versus the residential construction. So wood applications for nominal lumber or two-by material, small residential buildings, farm buildings, it's great for temporary structures. In fact, they use it a lot for form work, which is super temporary, and special structures. So maybe there's a feature or an art piece. It tends to lend itself very well. Uh, mass timber, you know, it is the wild west of construction right now. We don't know every way and every use that it is going to be perfect. We don't even have perfected systems of building with it. Everybody doing it is starting from scratch. Um, you know, my husband's firm has like five towers that if they were built when they started designing them would have been the tallest wood towers in the world. Um, I think one of them still might be definitely tallest in Canada, but we know four other firms that are in the exact same situation. So, you know, there isn't precedent to look at the same way. Um, you know, we're trying to find these standardized solutions to our problems. But, so far, they tend to be being used for libraries, arenas, condos, schools, and high-rises. Precast concrete. We're going to go quickly through precast. We did the three main ones I want to talk about. Um, precast concrete is kind of um, uh, a combination of steel and uh, concrete because we make it in a shop. Um, but it has some of the benefits of concrete in placement. Um, so it's very durable, good wearing surfaces, uh, really good quality control, which we didn't have in concrete. Because we're doing it in a shop, it's very easy to have quality control. We can pre-stress, which means if something, um, if we have this beam that wants to uh, compress at the top and stretch at the bottom, if I had put something in here and pulled it tight so that it was already like this a little bit, now when I go to bend it, it's actually unloading it some. So that's pre-stressing. We're not going to spend a lot of time about pre-stressing, but pre-stressing can be very handy for things. We can take that concrete that couldn't span long spans and make it span long spans. And that is because of that pre-stressing technique that I talked about. Finishes. It makes great finishes. It is still non-combustible and still has good fire ratings and still has good acoustics. So all things that came from the concrete side of it. Disadvantages is it's often not ductile. Um, the joints um, uh, are a little bit harder to connect, um, so we lose a lot of that ductility we have in concrete. Um, regular grids and future flexibility. So again, it needs to be on regular grids. That's what makes it cost affordable. Um, and we've taken away future flexibility. We're not gonna spend any much time talking about precast except for one particular type of precast, and that is called hollow core. And we're gonna talk about that um, when we do our sizing guidelines later in the term. But it is basically a thing that lets us get rid of um, our concrete on metal deck and our purlins or our open web steel joists and replace it with one thing. So it kind of um, can make construction be a little bit smoother. Um, you're going to run into some teachers at U of T that hate it on principle, and they get mad that I even talk about it uh, because they say I'm taking you down a dark road. But I cannot deny a market, and I cannot tell a client um, what is... Um, uh, I cannot deny them a good idea based on simply uh, what... Um, I think I have to do what I think is appropriate for the project. Um, and precast can be better environmentally um, because we have less waste. Um, you know, it's more controlled and it's more refined. Um, so if we accept that concrete is a bad building material environmentally, which it is, precast is the lesser evil of it, if you will. Um, Precast concrete can be really good for parking garages, motels, apartment buildings, schools, cladding. Cladding is its big one. And stadiums, elements within the stadiums. And remember, you don't have to memorize these. 
the assignment, you can come back and look at these lists and the exam will be open book. So you will be able to come back and look at these. I don't expect you to memorize them, but I expect you to have a general idea about it. Stop and think about what types of buildings you've seen in each of these materials. And this list is just a formalization of what you already tend to know about these materials. So masonry, again, I said isn't used very much anymore, but it's nice to know about because it can fit its way in um, for some projects. It's durable, it's economical, it's very cheap, it's non-combustible and has a good fire rating, similar th and acoustics, and decaying corrosion resistance, similar things to what we saw with concrete. Speed, it is very labor intensive to install it. It's why masonry used to be big back in the day, but now it takes a labor force, or you, you, and you can't speed it up by putting more people on the problem. You can usually only have one or two guys, people, working away at that wall slowly. Um, it has limited loading conditions. It's not very strong, um, and there are just some things it is not good at whatsoever. Um, and quality control is a real problem. In fact, my biggest complaint about designing with masonry is that if I say, build a masonry wall with 15 M bars at 400 on center and grout the cores, I have on many projects shown up and seen grouted cores, but there's no rebar inside it. So they missed the important part. The rebar, the grout is there to hold the rebar in place and connect it to the masonry. So without the rebar, that grout is ineffective and not doing anything. Um, proportions. Its proportions are a little bit bigger than what we do with concrete. Um, so we're going to talk about proportions a lot when we talk about our sizing guidelines in a couple weeks. Masonry applications are really good um, for walls, so internal partitions in low-rise buildings. Um, foundations that aren't retaining earth. You know what? I don't even like to use masonry as foundations. It's even when I moved to Toronto, it was still being done some. Um, I don't see it very often anymore. Um, we saw a failure image of a masonry foundation wall um, because it didn't have reinforcing in it. Uh, it can be really good for cladding. Um, so brick is also masonry. So we have masonry block and then brick. So it's really good as a cladding in that respect. Okay, how do we pick what material to use? I can tell you that there is no right answer, but there is a general process you should think about. These are the things you should consider when picking what material you need. You will notice that I am not giving you answers about what is the right building material for all, all of these. I've given you lists that show uh, advantages and disadvantages from these material, for all the materials, and you have to take that list and when you're trying to pick your material, think about how it, it, what things are important on this list to your project. Because not everything on this list is a governing thing on your project. So you have to have the ability to figure out how this list interacts with those advantages and disadvantages of the materials. I'm not testing you on that by any means, but you should start getting into that habit. And I'll try to talk through one or two examples. First place to start, Precedent. I'm doing a mid-rise condo. Huh. Precedent is concrete, reinforced concrete. Done. Problem solved. I've picked my material. If that doesn't work, now I'd start to look at the rest of the list. But you should start with precedent and only deviate from that if there is a good reason to. If precedent is there, you it's because it has been worked through. It means it's probably the cheapest probably the easiest, probably the most available. So those are all the things that you need to think about. Second, availability of materials. Well, maybe uh, we're in a concrete shortage, and so all of a sudden that concrete mid-rise condo isn't the way we can build it. We need to think about something else. Um, cost. Maybe the concrete's available, but there's a blip in the market, and it's really expensive because we can't get sand, which is happening right now in our market. We have a problem that, because of COVID, we don't have access to everything the same way we did a year ago at this time. So the market has some weird fluctuations happening right now. I, um, I'm building a tree fort at our cottage the second we can get there um, for my kids, 
and I did a costing takeoff of all the materials, and I went back and looked at Home Depot's costing list for um, pressure treat SPF lumber, and it is 70% more expensive than it was last year. And I know how much it was last year because I built a play structure in the backyard for them. Um, so a 70% premium on normal lumber that you go into Home Depot and buy. So, you know, that's a market that has gone absolutely bananas uh, because of COVID. Um, you need to look at fire resistance. Is, uh, is your building, um, first off, can you have combustible? If you can't, if it's a non-combustible building, if you want to use wood, you have to encapsulate it. You have to use drywall. Um, you have to look at what the fire resistance is. If it has a two hour fire rating requirement, so that means combustible or not, it will tell you how long the, mem the members need to function at a certain rate for two hours. Um, uh, and if you were using wood, even though it's a combustible building and your wood's all gonna burn away, or you're using steel and it's all going to lose its strength, maybe concrete is the right choice. So this is where you have to stop and think about how it applies to your building. Um, heights and spans, do you need long spans? If so, maybe concrete's not a good choice. Uh, does it have ridiculous loads? Um, maybe there's durability issues um, and that makes you want to use concrete. Self-weight, um, is it going to be, uh, if it's going to be too heavy due to concrete, maybe it's not the right option. This is going to have a big impact on seismic design. And we're going to see when I talk about loading in a couple weeks that um, uh, seismic design is, or the seismic load, the earthquake load we apply to a building, is a function of its weight. So it is related to how much it weighs. If we're in a high seismic zone, um, we're going to want the lightest building we can get because it means we have the least amount of seismic load on our building. Lateral loads, those are the loads that make our building tip over. Wind and earthquake being the primary ones. Uh, soil loads can as well, but, but wind and seismic being the primary ones. Um, that can have an impact on what type of material we're building with. Depth of floor sandwich. If, um, if we have an overall height restriction on our building, and we can keep our concrete assembly down to 600, and our steel assembly needs to be 800 millimeters thick. That 200 millimeters, if it's a 10-story building, you know, that's, we're talking about a two-meter difference in our building height because of that. Um, and maybe you have a maximum height restriction on your building, and so you've just lost a whole floor due to your, depth, your floor assembly depth. Serviceability requirements. If you have really tight assemb uh, serviceability requirements, this would be an example where I talked about the MRI on the fourth floor at uh, Gold Ring with the Olympic weightlifting floor uh, being hung from it on the third floor. Um, there were serviceability requirements that were tighter than normal, and we had to introduce more concrete locally because of that. Uh, dynamic loading, which is tied back into earthquake, Soil conditions, if you have bad soil conditions, you might think about what construction material you use. If we are building on fill, on very kind of um, a specific type of foundation construction, maybe we don't want to do concrete because we it's too heavy and it's um, the load comes down in more spots. So maybe we want to think about steel in that. Drainage, what's our roof plan like? That might contribute to our material. Rentability, future flexibility. This is where adaptability in structures is becoming a big player um, in construction concepts. Um, so Jackie, sorry, you heard that there's a third module yes. today. I'll, if you get him started, I'll, I'll pop in just before yes. you have to leave. Thank you. Um, uh, Future flexibility, yeah. So, um, you know, adaptability of buildings is really important. Um, you know, my husband and I postulate all the time about um, self-driving cars. Once self-driving cars start to come around, maybe everybody doesn't need two or three cars because it can go park itself somewhere. 
Um, downtown might need less parking spots because of this. Um, and so what happens to all the parking garages? In fact, the parking garages he's done in the past five years are all, um, instead of those tight floor heights just to get a car in, they have raised heights where they put stackers in, knowing that in the future, those stackers can come out and it can be converted into a condo, for example. So future flexibility can have a big part in it. And then it is certainly not last, but I have written it last because after you've thought of all of that, now is where your imagination comes in. The architectural constraints on the building are listed last because you should think about all the other things and now start thinking about the architecture. Once you've thought about all that, what does the architectural constraints on the project lead to your decision? Um, and it is probably one of the most important ones after precedent, I'd say. Um, and now, now you get to bring in your requests into the project, essentially. So I've broken these slides out into what does each part of the building do? You know, we have, um, you know, bending elements. So these are the floors and the roofs um, and the beams and the deck. Uh, columns and walls. So those are the axial components, the things that support load straight down. Um, lateral load resists so uh, bending elements. So those are your floor plane elements. Axial elements, walls and columns, the ones that support loads straight down. Lateral elements, the things that stop your building from tipping over. Foundations are what your building is sitting on. And then we have cladding support and mis miscellaneous elements. So floors and roofs are often a reinforced concrete slab. They can be a metal deck and beams and or joists. So that would be purlins or joists with a metal deck is our floor system. Wood decking or plywood with joists and beams, so our floor system. Sheathing or decking with light gauge steel framing. It's not as common, um, and in fact, there was a uh, um, kind of a, a mass casualty just in late December, not a mass casualty, but a, 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 a I'm missing my words, uh, a failure, a construction failure, um, where it was a uh, light gauge steel framing. That's not to, that's not to say it's a bad construction type, it's just, if you didn't know what it was, you might have heard about that in the news and thought about it just a little bit. And then there can be other special systems as well, kind of less common that we can build with. The role of the roof. It needs to support the environmental loads and possibly people up on the roof. Maybe you have a rooftop patio, for example. Uh, it needs to be able to transfer the loads to the columns. So if this is a beam and I put a person right here, it needs to work so that it doesn't fail, but it also needs to get the loads to the columns. And now I can think about the columns. It needs to support the building envelope. So maybe I have uh, roofing on top of this that it needs to support. It needs to slope to drains. If I have a drain over here, maybe I need to slope my roof a little bit. Diaphragm action. We need to keep our building square in plan. We don't want it bending. We want something to make it move as a whole. We don't want it to skew at the corners because we'll bust up all of our finishes on the floor. And this is more architectural, but it's important that structure know it. We might need it to be part of the fire separation. So if we have a fire on the third floor, that it can't spread up to the fourth floor. The floor system, mostly very similar roles. So it has to support the occupant load. It has to get the load to the columns and walls. We have to provide a surface or the base for special finishes and covering. So, so it could be a bare concrete floor, or we need something that we can adhere the flooring to. So if it was just metal deck, that can be a problem because just metal deck looks like this. You can't walk on this, you'll trip. So if it's just a metal deck and not concrete on metal deck, we'll often still 
just apply a piece of plywood thin. It's not structural. It's not doing anything. But we'll apply a, a piece of plywood to the top so that you can put carpet or roofing or not trip when you try to walk. Again, diaphragm action and possibly part of fire separation. What do you need to think of? Now, some of these things are very similar to the other list. We need to think about what building material we're using. We need to think about what the fire rating of the building is and if it's combustible or non-combustible. We need to think about how far it needs to span. So if there's long spans, maybe this floor needs steel in it. Um, what are the occupant loads? So are there special things like MRIs or Olympic weightlifting systems? What's the self-weight, depth of floor sandwich, serviceability, drainage for future flexibility, and architectural considerations? So many of those were the same ones that were in our overall building considerations. Columns and walls can often be built out of reinforced concrete. Um, we can do concrete block, brick, or stone masonry, less common. Structural steel columns, wood stud bearing walls, uh, light gauge steel bearing walls. So those are the more common ones. The role of the column and or wall. It has to transfer the gravity loads from the floor, from the roof or floor, down to the foundation. We have to get it down to something. And so in our case, our foundation is usually, uh, you know, into the soil. So we eventually want to get that into the concrete foundation, which will transfer it to the soil. It often has a secondary role. As much as what we need it to do is to get the axial loads down to the floor, if it is an exterior column or wall, so it's outside over here, when the wind blows, it also wants to push on this wall. So it's making it act in bending. So it's supporting the floors as a gravity load, but its secondary job might be a wind wall or a wind column as well. We're not going to spend a lot of time talking about any of those things or analyzing those, but I want you to understand that it can have two jobs at once. The burden on the compression element. We don't want it to squash, so we don't want it to squash. We don't want it to buckle, pop out sideways. We don't want it to deflect too much because we'll damage our finishes. Possibly, we don't want it to bend under wind load. And if it is part of the lateral load of resisting system, we might need it to be part of the lateral load resisting system. Um, Columns would often be uh, in steel, a wide flange, a hollow section. We're going to look at what all of these things look like. Um, a composite shape and kind of as a last resort, a truss. And we'll look at pictures of all of these. Wood, we do sawn lumber or an engineered wood product, a built up element, which means we laminate two pieces of wood together with screws or glue. Uh, concrete, it could be plain or reinforced. Masonry, it could be plain or reinforced. Load-bearing walls uh, would be reinforced concrete, masonry. We could do wood stud and plywood. So that's, um, you know, where we have, uh, if this was a plan section, um, these are a series of studs and our plywood wall. Uh, we can do the same thing with steel studs. So that would be our light gauge steel studs. We can have other systems for sure. Um, uh, by a combination of walls and columns, so we can mix them up. We can do hangers. So if we hung, like if we did in a gold ring, the second and third floor are hung from the underside of the fourth floor with a steel rod or a cable. Or we can do transfer beams, which is, and this is that example that I talked about with the table, where if the load was in the middle, we know half goes to each end, but it doesn't have to be a column there. It could be another beam. And so in plan, and I think I drew this last week as well. So in plan, all of these are, we have four roof elements, we have four floor elements, and more floor elements, we have our columns or walls here. 
But look at this one. We want an open space under here. So what we have to do is take something in bending that goes all the way across and support this column above. It could be another beam there that's doing something, but this becomes a transfer beam. But look for both of these. I do say, ultimately, the load is transferred to the foundation by either columns or walls, but hangers or transfer beams may be used in lieu of to just to get it to another part of the grid. So this still, it stops this one from coming down. It hits a transfer beam, but ultimately, it does still get to a column. Perimeter walls above grade are usually out of masonry, concrete, precast concrete, or wood or metal stud. Below grade, we almost always do reinforced concrete. It is ubiquitous for foundations. There are people talking about changing that. Um, it wouldn't surprise me if very soon we start to see reinf or, um, mass timber solutions for foundations. Um, uh, you could do preserved wood. It's not very common, but um, uh, you can have things like that. How do you pick your columns and walls? A lot of these are going to be the same as how you pick your overall building materials and how you pick your floors. So what's your overall building? If you've already got a concrete building, do concrete columns and walls. It's just going to be what you do. Um, and if not, what was your floor and roof system? Then think about that. An example where I might switch things up is in a wood house. If we have a masonry brick exterior finish that we need to support, we'll often use steel just because it is less susceptible to deflection and masonry is so susceptible to serviceability criteria that we might use some steel locally. What's the fire resistance? How high is it? You know, that might make um, a criteria on what one you pick, depending if you're exceeding some of the material limits. Um, what's the laterally unsupported height of your element? We're going to talk about what that means later in the term. The loads, is there bending in the column? So is it just supporting gravity loads or is it supporting gravity loads and have wind on the outside of it? Um, the size of the column, column, how does that impact rent, for example? And then dynamic loading. If there's dynamic loading, we have big earthquake forces. We might not um, want to look at masonry, for example, because it's not as good for dynamic criteria. So we might want earthquake. If it's really high, or we might want concrete. If it's a really high seismic zone, we might want steel, which does well for ductility, and it lowers the mass of our building, which lowers our earthquake forces. Um, some guidelines when you're designing your supporting system. Try to start with a regular layout. I'm not saying don't deviate from a regular layout, but have a rationale for your, your layout. Um, try to look at precedent, try to look at other things, but standardizing that layout is going to standardize your beam members. Remember we looked at that layout last week where uh, there was like 50 elements, but in the end we only had to design five or six because they were identical elements. Well, the same thing falls into play here. If you can get repetition, it gets cheaper. Not just because it's less time in engineering it, but also it makes it easier to fabricate. Um, saying you want a hundred different things versus a hundred of the same things, your cost is going to go down because of the repetition. Um, um, uh, if you're doing it in steel, can one column be multiple stories high? So, for example, is this column here actually one big long column that they can come and install one thing? Because there's a cost associated with um, piece count as well. So instead of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 columns, maybe it's only five columns. Um, and minimizing transfers. You can figure out pretty quickly that that's expensive. Try not to do that. I'm not saying don't do it, because that can be super important to the architectural desires of the project. But it's expensive. There's a premium that you pay for it. So let's talk about lateral load resisting systems now. Um, you need them on every floor, in every direction, for every building. You are going to have an answer, a question for this on the assignment. And it is going to be, when do you need a lateral load resisting system? 
The answer is every floor, every direction, every building. I will tell you the answer in the question because this is such an important thing. I want everyone to walk out of my course understanding they need a lateral load resisting system. And if your engineer says you don't have one, you need to be like, oh, damn, let's fix that because you know how important it is. Maybe you missed it, but you know you need to do something. If the engineer is telling you that that is missing, you have to do whatever it takes to try to solve that problem. So super important, every floor, every direction, every building, you need a lateral load resisting system. Now, every direction, if you have one in this direction and one in this direction, it can share the job for every other direction. They can share it out. So you just need some, you can't have them all in this direction because then there's nothing in this direction. So lateral load resisting systems, every floor, every direction, every building. And we're gonna look at pictures of these next week. The role of the lateral load resisting system. There's two jobs. We need to carry lateral loads due to wind and earthquake from the floor to the foundation. So we use diaphragms to do that. The diaphragms also keep the building square in plan. Um, and oh, oh, if you had a cardboard box and you squished it, it would be big. You know what? I have a cardboard box. Okay, if this is our building, and this is where our floor is, we have no diaphragm here. See that? It does not stay square in plan. So this is our building, but look down here. If I do the same thing, it stays square in plan. That has a diaphragm. This doesn't. The lateral load resisting system is doing the same job, but these are the walls stopping it from tipping over. It has more lateral load resisting system in that direction than it does in this direction. The burden of the lateral load resisting system. It needs to not fail under the loads. That's always our job. Uh, prevent the building from deflecting excessively. So too much deflection, it racks too much, our windows can pop out, drywall cracks, um, floor finishes crack, everyone gets pissed off, we all get sued and we all go out of business and end up doing something else. Uh, we also need to prevent the building from tipping over or sliding. So the lateral load resisting system is integral to the stability of the building. So basically, strength, stiffness, stability. Types of lateral load resisting systems. You can have a shear wall. So a shear wall just means the entire wall is your lateral load resisting system. Um, a concrete wall, if it's there, it's doing the job and it is our lateral load resisting system. Masonry wall, if it's there, it's part of the lateral load resisting system and it's doing its job. Wood, wood plywood with studs is a lateral load resisting system. My front window here, I've got a big hole in my lateral load resisting system. I don't have one at the front window bit, I've just got end bits. There are two tiny little lateral load resisting systems at the side. There's more to my house than that, so there is more to it. But that's just to give you an idea. An A-frame or a three-pinned arch. That's this. We have a pin, a pin, and a pin, but it's propped up against each other and it can't tip over. Um, a moment frame or a portal frame. Moment connections are expensive. We do not like to use them unless we have to. The very last lecture of this term, I am going to show you the implications of a moment frame. That it is not the place we start. We do not do it unless we have to. This is a moment connection right here. It is expensive, but often what they do in these designs is they ship them in and they prioritize them and they do it in the shop. The reason we don't like moment connections is they're often welded and welded in the field is hard. They also mean we have bigger members and overall our system is less stiff. Again, don't worry about that too much. I'm going to show you a whole lecture about that in the very last class. 
So how do you pick your lateral load resisting system? This is getting a little bit old now, you know most of this. Industry standard precedent for that building type. Flexibility, how much does it move? Um, future use, we could, I, I don't know what intent I had for flexibility there, but both, both criteria for it work. Is your building flexible? And future flexibility of your building. If you know you're gonna come back and put a bunch of doorways in it, maybe concrete isn't the right choice. Um, applied loads, so same thing that we've already talked about. You know, putting a big, massive, heavy thing on the top floor is gonna increase your seismic loads, so maybe we wanna think about that. And then think about what your floor and roof system is. That's going to have an impact on your lateral load resisting system. Um, for each building type, what's a common lateral load resisting system? Well, for wood frame construction, so this is our nominal lumber, our residential lumber, perimeter wood stud shear walls. So we have studs every 16 inches and plywood on the outside of it. Plywood is exactly like this cardboard wall that I have here. I can't skew this box. It's really hard to do. Um, uh, hotels and condos, probably concrete shear walls. Schools, load-bearing masonry shear walls tend to be quite common in schools. Commercial construction, often concrete shear walls or tilt-up walls. Industrial buildings and warehouses, remember those are often built out of steel, so a steel brace frame tends to be quite common for those. So that would be, that would be this style of construction here. Um, high rise office buildings. Um, it depends really on um, the location and what they're building the building out of. Um, and it varies, um, and there's no clear answer for it. Um, concrete shear wall, you could do a concrete core tube where you don't just take, as your stairwell, two walls this way and two walls this way. You actually make it act as one big tube. Um, uh, steel bracing, um, or a combination of these. So again, we're gonna look at pictures of these next week, don't worry. Arenas. So again, that's this style of construction. Probably you're going to pick moment frames in this direction and a series of these frames. And then in between them, you're probably going to do steel bracing. Um, what can't we do in Toronto? So this comes back to seismic. In Toronto, there are specific clauses for seismic design because we have seen um, uh, in zones where there were not good code criteria for seismic construction and older style construction that there was mass loss of life due to seismic um, events. So Haiti, for example, even though they didn't have as much construction and construction wasn't as high, the loss of life was astounding um, due to an earthquake. In New Zealand, surprisingly very little um, was there any loss of life in the massive? I feel I don't want to say none because then I'm I'm not honoring somebody that, that that's not appropriate. But if it wasn't if there was um, casualties, it was not a high amount of casualties considering the amount like, or the force of that earthquake. Um, and with that earthquake, um, there was massive um, structural damage, but but it was permanent deformation to to buildings that needed to be repaired, not. Um, the buildings collapsed and killed people. So um, we have very specific criteria that we enable for seismic zones now, and that is probably some of the most rigorous um, engineering we do now. Um, but some zones just don't have that many earthquakes. They're not that high. We don't have that much of a risk. The risk is not the same in Toronto, for example, as it is in San Francisco or uh, regions in China or Japan. So we have to think about um, where we are when we do that. Now, in Toronto, there are things we cannot do. We can't have too much torsion, or we can't have our building, actually this isn't great because it's so stiff, um, we can't, if this is our high-rise building, we can't have it twist too much under seismic loads. So why might it twist? If I had a really stiff lateral load resisting system here and not over here, 
this side might stay nice and rigid, but that side doesn't. Both might meet all the deflection criteria, and they might um, uh, work for the forces. But statistically, they've shown that even if we've done that, if there's too much torsion, the building can actually break apart, and we have our problem there. We can't do weak stories. Now, this means that you cannot have less than 10% of the capacity of the floor above you, even if your building is strong enough. So, let's say we have a building like this. And I'm going to draw a series of columns coming down. And I'll draw some floors in here. And by code, we only need braces right here. So let's say our building is strong enough with these braces. That works just fine. But let's say architecturally you're really enjoying the look and you want some patterning with it, so you've done that. Well, each of these upper floors has two braces, and down here we only have one. This story is half as stiff as this story. So what we would have to do is either not do this patterning or come up with a way around it. Maybe what we do is make this one twice as stiff so that this floor is still as stiff as these ones up above. So sometimes it takes creative engineering, but you can't have a weak story. Uh, that is one of the problems that they did find in Hades, that building sheared off at the ground floor and then pancaked, which was absolutely horrific. Um, in high seismic zones, they can't do those two things, but they also can't do this. You can't shift around the lateral in a resisting system. If you wanted to put in those other two braces, they would have to be in the same plane. They would all have to come down in the same zone. You can't shift them around, so there has to be some more consistency to it. Um, and you can't ignore capacity design options. Now, capacity design is not something we're going to really talk about. Um, it is above and beyond the scope of this course, but it is one of the few places that big advancements are happening in structural engineering. Um, material sciences, wood construction, and seismic design are probably the biggest regions in structural design that we're making advancements right now. And in seismic design, the idea is that if your building is ductile or it moves, it absorbs energy. And if it absorbs energy, we don't have to design it for as big of forces in the building. So you could say, all right, um, uh, I've made it ductile, I can design for less force, and it moves around, that's great. Um, I might be a lazy engineer and say, you know what, I'm just happy to design it for the maximum load and have it not absorb energy. I'll just take the max load and design it for that, no big deal. It's a bit more expensive for uh, the building, but all right, let's do it. In high seismic zones, you can't do that. You have to do it as a capacity design system. So you have to take extra engineering steps to do it. Now, in most places, it actually reduces the cost of uh, construction. It increases the cost of engineering drastically, but it decreases the cost of construction. And engineering is a small component in the, the design cost. So bear that in mind as the architect, because you're often negotiating the fees on the engineer's behalf, that if they're doing a major undertaking to take cost out, the premium in paying them is much less than the cost they're going to save in the long run. In Toronto, capacity design doesn't actually save us much material. Um, in fact, it probably doesn't save us any material. We could go through all the increased cost of engineering and not save any material because wind loads govern our design. And we don't get to take anything out for capacity design in wind load, just seismic. And if that's the case, we've done all this extra engineering and we haven't saved the client any money. So in Toronto, we will do no or part capacity design, depending on it. There are certain types of buildings that we have to do capacity design, even in Toronto, like a post-disaster building, which we're going to talk about soon. 
but most of the time we'll limit or we'll economize our, um, our, our seismic design. That doesn't mean make it not work. It very much means make it work. It just means we might not um, throw all of the engineering cost at it. So here are your takeaway tips. You should understand the role of structure. You should um, know major uh, construction materials and their strengths and weaknesses. You should know how to pick your material. I'm not saying you need to know what material to pick, but you should have a general idea on how to go about picking your material. You should know the major parts of a building and what they do, like the floor systems, the roof systems, the, the gravity systems, like the, the columns and walls, and the lateral load resisting systems. You should know what a lateral load resisting system is, or LLRS is a lateral load resisting system. And you should know what types they are. I haven't shown you any pictures yet, so you don't know necessarily what they look like. Start thinking about it. Start imagining buildings you know and start thinking about that. And next week I'm going to show you pictures of all these. So this is a shorter lecture because, oh my goodness, it's mind-numbingly boring. Um, uh, hopefully, maybe you haven't sat through and watched it all in one go. If so, I appreciate that. You're probably tired and bored of my voice now. So I'm going to end this lecture and next week um, is still kind of boring. There's not a lot of information in it, but it is looking at all of these things. And because the only way to make something like that interesting is to tell anecdotes. So I'll try to tell stories from my construction experience and other people that I've worked with that have shared their stories with me. Just to give you a sense, and sometimes hearing a funny story helps you remember something about that construction too. So that's next week. Uh, congrats on the end of week three, guys.